I'm Ian Phillips, I'm from ARM. So I'm going to talk about computing platforms the 21st century and as usual I hope to try and bring a slightly different perspective to these things. Well I think when we talk about platforms probably the, uh, the most familiar uh, interpretation of platforms are the sort of platforms that we find in the PC world, maybe in the mainframe world, uh, but it's still kind of uh, difficult to know what we mean by platforms. So even in the PC, are we talking about Windows or are we talking about the physical object? Um, we also have the Mac and the PC. And in the mainframe, you're really not talking about the hardware for sure. Uh, you're likely to be talking about the language or the operating system. Uh, it gets complicated and I think the essence of it is we don't really know what platforms are. Uh, and therefore we all have our own interpretations of it. Not surprisingly then, portable computing just confuses this already confused picture just a little bit more. Of course, the uh, information that we've already gleaned about the 20,000 sensors in Santander, Smart Santander, um, really just goes to show that we've got another level of platform which is starting to make an appearance and we still haven't answered those questions. Uh, is it the chip that's a platform, or the PC that's a platform, or the ARM IP which is in it, which is a platform? That's assuming that it's ARM based, which it almost certainly is. Um, or what about the RTOSs? Well, there are 45 real-time operating systems listed on ARM's website. Uh, are they the platforms? We're certainly not seeing a reduction in the number of platforms, we're seeing a diversity in the platforms. Or is it the design tools, the tools that enable people to create these uh, smart systems or the components, the sensors? Or is it the, uh, the use of digital logic? Is it Boolean, um, Bool with his, um, with his binary mathematics? Or is it uh, analog? We're not, we're not excluding any of these things because they're all enabling us to produce the, uh, the systems that, uh, that abound. Nevertheless, by far, this area, the embedded area, represents the biggest footprint of computers today. And you have to bear that in mind because it may be the other area of computers that you're thinking about when you think of as a computer, but actually this is the area that people experience. And they experience it in all kinds of ways. I'm talking to an audience here that knows this, but I want you to think about all of the people who don't know this. Most of the people who are using these products don't think of them as computers. Not at all. They're a washing machine, or a printer, or a TV, or a camera, or a reader. They're an, I, an, I play, um, an MP3 player, or a remote controller. They are not objects of computation, they're objects of functionality. And then of course you've got the invisible ones. And these are actually more numerous, and uh, more system dependent. If you look at there, things like your, uh, the car, there's a picture there of my car, I'm proud of my car. Uh, it's a high speed, a high performance computer, as far as I'm concerned. It just, just reiterates, redefines what you mean by performance, of course. But then medical and the power and the congestion charges and, uh, and energy generation. The cup of tea and the suitcase represent logistics. You think about a cup of tea and the difficulty in getting pure water in getting um, the ceramics there in place, in getting the energy to you to allow you to boil the water, uh, and the tea which is, which is going to be made in the faraway part of the world and brought to you at a level which is cheap. All of those things are enabled by electronics today, electronic systems today. Now I'm being very careful here because although ARM has in some respects got an image as being a hardware company, it's not. We're a system company. We help people to make complex electronic systems. Now I'll come back to what we do a little bit later on. But it starts off with an idea of computing, because computing is not just digital computing. And it's not therefore purely about what you can implement as a microcontroller or how you can express it as a chip. The chip is no more important than the software. The software is no more important than the RF part of the system or the optical part of the system or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the MEMS, the micro, the micro electronic machines. All of these activities are important parts of a system, because remember, the systems are what people buy. So, I would move to start with, as a, as a fairly general position, that electronic systems 
are the future for the 21st century. Whatever the 21st century is going to become, whatever it's going to be made of, whatever good things or bad things come out of it, electronic systems will be underpinning all of them. You can look around that circle, you'll find the headlines which are, if you like, the social concerns, and you'll find that electronic systems underpins all of them. Now another thing which people in general are not aware of, and it's useful to point it out to you too, is how dependent we are on electronic systems even today. I've already shown it in my first introductory slides, how many ways electronic systems are embedded in our life. Take them out. What would happen? Major economic disruption is what would happen. And we're not in the exercise of reducing our dependency on electronic systems, we're in the, in the business of increasing our dependency on them. Now the good news about this is it will enable us to have far more sophisticated uh, services and uh, abilities and buy in our products. They will be cheaper, they will perform better, whatever they are. But at the same time we're also building in a dependency. We're depending on others for this because no single country or nation or group of countries can own all of the skills and technologies which are necessary to make electronic systems. That's just not a realistic ambition anymore. It would have been a few years ago perhaps, but it isn't anymore. We have to recognize that electronic systems are already products of the world. They're products of the world not just in where they're manufactured, but where they're designed, the tools that come in to use that to help that design process, the whole methodology associated with it. It's all a product of the world. And what we can hope for and is actually a reasonable objective for all individual countries to achieve, and that is a state of, natural, of mutual natural codependence. So that means that we depend on them as much as they depend on us. Now that's a good supply relationship. It means that uh, you can guarantee that they will get, uh, you will be able to buy their component of the system from um, for yourself, you can be able to buy it from them, and similarly, in, in, in exchange, you will be providing your ability into that pool. So, an, the animation of electronic systems is so much more than just putting a chip in it. Um, so, if you've got a fab, it doesn't cure the problem. A fab is only part of the system. If you, you've got to be good at, you've got to include in the electronic system, the software, and all of the other components which are necessary. The most important technology in an electronic system product is the technology that you don't have, not the one that you do have. Because if, you, if you've got a smartphone and it's not got a G3 connection, then it's not a smartphone. It doesn't matter how many chips and how much software is, has gone into it, or the packaging technology that have gone into it, or anything else like that. The piece of the technology jigsaw puzzle that's missing is the piece that's the most important. So you can, you can assume for a moment then that all of your technologies are going to be component parts of this. They're not going to be the key link in the chain. They're going to be a link in the chain. It only becomes important when yours is the one which is missing. And, uh, and of course, people strive to maintain their position in the value chain so that they're able to, uh, to maximize the profitability of it, if you're indeed in business to do that. Anyway, moving on. Electronic systems technologies will literally be the platform on which the 21st century is created. But I've got to say something about business here, because it's important to realize that business is about making money. We can talk about open and free software, but those are different aspects of business. If nobody is making money out of the creation of a product, the product will cease to exist. There has to be money in the, in the chain somewhere. Businesses won't do things if they don't involve money. So you also have to bear that in mind. Businesses in particular have investors to satisfy. Investors are the people who hold your pension funds. You expect your pension fund to grow, which essentially means you expect the business to be successful. So, in essence, you are all driving forward this, uh, this capitalist uh, approach. Selling things, then, that people want to buy is the, uh, is the objective of business. And people don't buy technology. They buy products. Now, the attraction of globalization in all of this is that it enables businesses to focus on their, co their core competencies. 
because now businesses don't have to be all things. They don't have to be good at manufacture if the thing that they're really good at is design. It enables them to contribute their, their skill, their core competence, into the pool of designing or creating electronic systems products and let somebody else do the manufacturing, let somebody else do the testing, let somebody else do the commissioning, let somebody else do the technical support. There are a lot of components in the creation of electronic systems. And globalization and the technologies which enable it have enabled that to change quite significantly, and I'll come back to that. Businesses are also not looking for perfection. They're only looking for differentiation. So it's not necessary to produce the best product. It's only necessary to produce a product which is better than your competitors. Um, the, the measure of this is, is really down to how, how much different can it be such that a user will notice. So users don't notice 10% difference in CPU speed. Users don't notice how fast it does a certain benchmark. Users notice when they take a picture and it take, seems to take quite a long time before they can take the next one. Or when the page refresh seems to take a long time. Or sometimes when it takes a, an abnormally long pause before the music starts. Those are the things that consumers notice, not the performance of individual processes. Although once upon a time when the processor of your concern in your platform was on your desk, then you did notice it. And uh, when you got a a better GPU which enabled the images to be rendered more quickly, then it did start to matter. And when you had some issues of, about whether it should be an Intel or an AMD processor that was in there, and there was a performance difference that, that uh, came into it, that enabled some people to stick a logo on the outside which says Intel inside. Um, that mattered at one stage. It doesn't really matter anymore. The thing that comes out of this as a logical conclusion, though, is new products are expensive and risky, and business is not in the, in the uh, exercise of taking risk unnecessarily. Business's objective is to use what it can, what's known, to create product differentiation. So it uses essentially as little technology as possible, as little advanced technology as possible, um, and because the introduction of any new technology just increases the cost, and increases the risk. You have to be careful that not all technologies increase the value, so I've already said that. Uh, so design is a cost and a risk to be minimized and that will of course explain a lot of you exp experience to uh, wanting just a couple more heads to help you achieve whatever it is that you're trying to do and of course business is actually trying to get something out. It's not actually in the business of employing large groups of people. But a point to remember out of this is technology is never a product in its own right. Technology is a component of a, of a product, but is never a product. Now, Moore's Law you're all familiar with, but I will express it here and I'll hopefully bring out some different aspects of it. And here I'm using some pretty dated information. It's the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon 1999. And you'll see why in a moment. Nevertheless, the um, up and to the right exponent is one that we're all familiar with. And uh, ARM, when it was created in 1991, we were talking about a million transistors. And of course, today we're talking about 20 billion transistors for a few euros. It's not, it's not um, new information to you. But what might be new information to you is that's 20,000 times more capacity in the 20 years since ARM came into existence. Which means that the product that we were putting our skills into is 20,000 times less complex than the product that we're designing today. Just in a silicon level, never mind the system level, which arguably uh, takes that to a square law. This is just in the linear law of, of transistors in the, in the circuit. So electronics, so um, uh, Moore's law is really a statement of growing opportunity. Now it's the markets that actually provide the growth drivers. Interesting observation here. You can see the uh, uh, mainframe becoming mini, becoming personal, becoming desktop, mobile internet, and people are talking about internet of things. Um, you can see the numbers go up to the right and as they do so, orders of magnitude. Don't dwell too much on these figures, there's some shapes in the graph which are important to note, but the principal thing to note about this is it's the top one that you notice. Internet of Things is becoming the buzzword, Internet of Things is where all of the activity will be, Internet of Things is where all the volume will be, 
But the others haven't gone away. It's just that they're not the market leaders anymore. And the other thing to, to, to point out is that as you move up and to the right, the skills necessary to use these products go down. So you don't need to be a computer scientist to use an embedded sensor or a smartphone. So these products have been de-skilled in their human interface to a point where ordinary people can use them without having to go through the first levels of formal uh, education uh, with the exception of being able to read and write. That's, sort of, that's just about it. Uh, and indeed kids can use a lot of the iPhones and the iPads of course before they're able to even read and write. But yesterday's markets are still valuable and are still important. So you can still be working on mini and mainframe and personal computers and they're not going to go away. They're just not going to be the major thing that people notice. Now the other thing on that graph that I didn't examine was the red line at the bottom. And this is why this is a significant one, because it's a productivity line, effectively. It's the number of gates that were able to be produced per person, per month, whatever the, uh, uh, the metric is, it doesn't really matter. The point being that at the time when ARM was formed, that was around 100 person years uh, of effort necessary to produce a chip. In 1999 they were projecting forward productivity gap of the order of 2,000 to 8,000 uh, person years by 2007. What happened to that? that? That would have said we can't produce the systems that we're producing today because the productivity level hasn't improved that much. Well if you look at the lines of code per person, oh no, the other point was verification gap was on the horizon. It should have all been unaffordable, way unaffordable. But here we are, 2013, off the side of that graph, still producing systems ever more complex than they've ever been before. What happened to the productivity gap? Well, reuse happened to the productivity gap. Now this is arguably not clean design. You know, I know you guys are real designers, I'm a real designer by history. The exciting thing is writing new lines on a sheet of absolutely clear paper, whether it be virtual paper or, uh, or real paper, it doesn't really matter. That's the exciting stuff. Bad news actually, uh, reuse is the, ma the vast majority of what a product is created of. Pre-1990 chip design was entire. You started with a large sheet of paper, you did write the whole thing out yourself. You had a small team, you worked, you worked on it, and you were able to complete it inside a company. In fact, in 1975, I'm old enough to remember that, I did a chip design myself. Entire thing in three months, including mask generation. And it's, this is a, a scale of this exercise, but there was only a thousand gates on it. Did I mention that? A thousand doesn't seem very much these days. Circuit blocks, CPUs, external IP, up integration, chip reuse. We did a chip back in, would have been about 1992, 1993 before I was with ARM. Uh, it took us six months to work out why it didn't work. When we worked out why it didn't work, we had lost the original data set. So we didn't know what we had created. Hmm, whoops. But it's an illustration of how little reuse existed in that time. We didn't keep a formal database of all of the information that we were putting into a chip. So the idea of reusing one chip as the basis for the next one just didn't exist. It wasn't necessary. <clears throat> so all of those things, not just blocks, but with a supporting methodology. And that's where software started to come in. It delivered productivity, quality and reliability and it was the birth of the hardware software IP companies such as ARM. Our investors tend to think of us as a hardware company, but we're not. It also brought about the start of the commoditization of silicon and fabs. It didn't matter where you got your chip made anymore. That mattered in the past. So how much do we re use reuse today? Um, well, mobile products, around 500 million gates of SOC, 500 million lines of code, doubling every 18 months. Designer productivity of raw code is still just in the order of 100 to 1,000 lines per day. Tested, verified, incorporated, ready for use in a product code, that is, not just something you turned out over the weekend to demonstrate that something was possible. 
That's between tw- two and a half and 25,000 person years to do one of those designs clean sheet, unresourceable. Typical product designs have 50 to 200 person years of effort available to, do, to them. That's just half a percent of uh, the uh, resource that it would take to do this thing clean sheet. So we're already doing greater than 99% reuse in our products. That's not reuse the way the EDA guys would have you believe it, as in a cell library. This is reuse at the system level. We're making systems, we're making products, don't forget. So it's not viable to do clean sheet product design, nor has it been since around 1995. Uh, So where we were all looking, because I think most of us were around since 1995, so we've not kind of noticed that the world has changed. We're just doing it. Like bumblebees, they don't know that uh, they can't fly, they just fly. It's the aerodynamicists who believe that they can't fly. So the the core hardware software, of course, is only a part of it. There are all of those other components that I talked about most of which are necessary because if you're going to get your your system out then you can't have any of the things which it's dependent on not being there. So we reuse modules and components, we reuse code and circuits, methods and architectures, we use tools to accelerate methodology and we design for manufacturing, testability, quality, whatever you like. All of these are good productivity aids and they work. It's just that they're not easily counted. A significant part of this, however, is and will remain knowledge. The designer has done similar work before. The team has a collective experience. The company has experience and a customer base in those areas. These are all important parts of reuse when it comes to getting a system out. And if you also think that the role of the design engineer, and I can have another talk on this subject alone at some stage, is to create order out of chaos, then your role is not to, desi- to drive particular tools. Your role is to make a tool deliver a product. And it's not always easy, which is why, which is why you need to be an engineer, not a technician, or a scientist, not an engineer. It it, it requires a a degree of lateral thinking to overcome the limits and the limitations of the systems which you are presented with to enable you to do it. So platforms are essentially about productivity, reuse rather than developing, allowing you to focus on your value add and less on the the aspects of it that can be acquired uh, in a commodity from the open market. Globalization has changed the meaning of local, which you also should be aware of. It's no longer local as in close to where you live. We are a team these days. We're used to working across the cross nations, across the world. Um, we are used to, um, to finding answers to our problems and the situations that we're presented with by communicating with people that we know in other companies and in other countries. And yet we somehow haven't realized that this has fundamentally changed the nature of business and the nature of community. We still uh, talk, or people still talk about forming clusters. And when they talk about clusters, they talk about them in a small geographic region. It is increasingly meaningless. Platforms have changed the scope of reuse. Actually, business to, they've enabled actual business-to-business cooperation. That's partnering, not just outsourcing. In all aspects of business, that's including the administrative parts, not just the technology parts, irrespective of geographic location, irrespective of the tangibility of a product. So the virtual products, such that ARM produces, of course, are all part of this, this mechanism. And it's these businesses and what they're delivering, they still need to maintain their product differentiation. They need to avoid commoditization. Now, this is an interesting one because if you listen to your government leaders, they will tell you commoditization is a good thing. If you're in business, commoditization is a bad thing. Uh, Because in business, your objective is to make money. If you're a consumer, however, your objective is to get as much as you can for as little as possible. So if your perspective is as a consumer, then commoditization is a good thing. If your perspective is business, then commoditization is a bad thing. And those two forces are part of this equation and balancing the two is always going to be uh, the challenge. So, good platforms fit many niches. Now, 
struggled for a few years to try and uh, illustrate this, and I don't think I've really illustrated it here even, but there is a lot of things that go between a concept and a product, and there's a lot of gaps, and that's where the engineers sit, and the engineers are trying to use the tools which are available to fill those gaps, and they do them kind of imperfectly, but it doesn't matter, because as long as you get the product out, what matters is you've got that gap filled, not how well you did it. But if you're pursuing higher and higher levels of productivity, then you want to fill the big gaps. And the, uh, the gap in the, in the illustration there, I think, is a, is a significant one. Clearly, it's, it's a, a large object and it needs to be handled a little bit. And if you can produce a bright and shiny piece of IP which will fit that gap, then you're home and dry because then everybody will want to buy it and the gap will be filled and the productivity goes up. But uh, those who, who've got the keen eyesight and those at the back of the room, I apologise, uh, you'll see that that block doesn't fit the hole, really. It only kind of fits the hole. So uh, the reality of platforms in this context is they're usually imperfect. They increase productivity and quality when they're used, and the fit gets better with time on both sides. So you adapt the platform, the component that you fit, and also the environment adapts to the components which are available. This is why you use C, after all. Everybody hates C, and yet it's a good language, it's got a lot of advantages, it's a good productivity tool, it's got a lot of flexibility, it's got some problems. Everybody can tell you of another language which is better, but C is good enough. That's where we're, that's where we're coming from. So we know that all expo exponents must end, and so the writing is on the wall for Moore's Law, isn't it? Um, growing op opinion is that 14 or maybe 7 nanometer will be the smallest yieldable node ever. Nothing smaller than that. Three or four generations, five to eight years, end of planar scaling. Oh well, we'll have all finished by then, we can go home because there's nothing else is going to happen, right? Uh, and in fact, you can also say that only the things which are on the drawing board today can get into the last of the planar chips. So if you've got any great ideas about what's going to help with productivity a few years down the road, forget it. Planar technology is going to end in a few years' time, so unless your thing is already being worked on today, forget it. It's not going to, ha not going to apply to the planar chip. It also marks the end of clean sheet synthesis, scalable processor arrays, formal design, top-down methods, all of these things that have been on the wall for a long time, people have been talking about them for a long time, not going to happen. The end of Moore's Law, May? maybe? Well actually I take a different perspective on this and I don't think that Moore was all that smart really. Um, he, he, ju he was just thinking about something that was happening to him back in around 1965, 1970. And he was talking about um, how uh, the ability to create chips, bigger chips, was, was multiplying by a factor of two roughly every year, or a little bit longer. Um, and he just observed that, and he, and he based, based his observation on a, um, a circuit that he designed which had 18 gates in it, sorry, 16 gates in it, and he was designing a new one which had 32 in it. So it was a fairly limited um, uh, observation. Nevertheless, uh, the industry loved it and so it went forward. In fact, the industry didn't love it for nearly 10 years after he said it, uh, but nevertheless, it, uh, it has some value in here. What I would maintain is that this is a thing which has been going on for very much longer, actually. That's the electronic era. Uh, it went on be before that in the mechanical era. It went on before that in, uh, in, in wood and stone and uh, bronze and iron. Uh, these are the technologies which are available to provide solutions to, the, to human needs. And it will go on. So we, the microelectronics era that Gordon Moore was describing is really just one of those transit, uh, transit um, uh, methodologies, I suppose, which are, which are applicable to the delivering of systems that, cut, that people need. We're moving into the electronic systems era. There will be another era that follows it. What that means, we don't know. But let's look at what system integration is doing to maintain, uh, let's say, Moore's law, Moore's system law. We're already recognizing the limits of planar technology, so we're starting to go 3D. Uh, we've been stacking chips for a few years now. Um, they, we will be stacking chips with different dyes, uh, different processes. That gives a wonderful level of um, 
uh, of integration and capability because it enables you to get the best out of some uh, analog technologies and the best out of some digital technologies. And we will be going um, to uh, from a fairly simple die stacking through to what's called chiplets where the die are actually the same size and they sit right on top of each other. And you'll still be surprised just how many die you can get on top of each other and it will still fit in a package which is less than one and a half millimeters from top to bottom. Because dies are inherently quite thin. Indeed, August uh, this year, Samsung announced their first 24-layer 3D flash. This is actually a 3D process where they're assembling the active devices and 24 layers of, uh, of, of deposited silicon. This is fantastic. But the human brain is around a million times denser than the thing that we're producing on silicon today. So there's a lot of scope for increasing the, uh, uh, the packaging of system technology. And if you look at these, you'll also think of it, it's not just integrated onto one chip. It doesn't have to be done in a fab. The package of a product is a lot more complicated than that already. Take these things apart. They are wonderful. Uh, they're full of stuff. And you, you've got to ask yourself, how on earth is it all put together? The analog, the digital, the embedded software, mechanics, plastics, glass, MEMS, displays and transducers, robotics for the assembly, test, knowledge and know-how. There's a huge amount of stuff in there. And you buy it on a service plan from a, uh, from a phone company and it costs you a few euros a month. Uh, this technology has become below the level of, the, uh, of human perception. And yet it is very specialist. Oh, the other point there was round and round the world. Go back. Go back. Thank you. Many specialist businesses round and round the world. These things apparently go round the world three times before they get to you. So they, they don't necessarily do it as an entity. They do it as components manufactured, designed in different places, manufactured in different places, coming together in different places for the sub-assemblies, for the modules, uh, and so it goes. So it's exciting stuff. And it's not just from Europe, not least from Europe. There's a lot of technologies in here, and we know from what we can see here, not all of them are computing technology in the sense of you write it, you write it in C and you compile it and it executes. But they are nevertheless computing technologies in the sense that they process data, representations of world, real world environments. They process it. So you've still got analog computers in there. They're just called RF stages and, and power amplifiers and things of that nature. We have displays, display technologies, and the, uh, not just the image processing which is necessary to make the pixel the right color, but the technology which makes the, the display itself possible and the touch sensitive overlay onto this. All of these are in very, very important parts of making that into a product. And we know that more than 99% of it is reused, which is why it's jolly difficult to get into the smartphone business if you're not already in the smartphone business. The amount of background knowledge that you have to acquire is so huge that it becomes an entry barrier. But that also applies to why it becomes very difficult to displace a company like ARM, or indeed a company like Intel. It's not just the chip or the IP that they produce, it's the environment, the package in which they do it. And that whole thing is necessary if you're going to, uh, if you're going to compete with those people. So, quick look inside, just to remind you that there is stuff inside there. Most people think of a phone as just being a chip. Well, it's not a chip, there's 20 chips inside a smartphone. Uh, made by all of these companies all over the world and it's pretty scary stuff. You know, that's a double-sided printed circuit board. You get an idea of how small it is from the top, uh, top of the board. If you think about it, how do you make the components on one side stay on while you solder the components on the other side? It's only a small point, but it is a real issue of a technology which is embedded. You don't notice it. Inside the A4 chip, uh, we find there are three dies stacked on top of each other, two memory dies and a processor die, that's a cross section. The processors are attached by solder bumps. That's actually pretty scary technology in itself. The processor unit itself, this is not the um, A4 processor but it's a Tegra 3 from NVIDIA which is about the same level of integration. It's got five arms in it, it's actually got six arms in it, one of them you can't see on that diagram. It's got around a billion transistors 
Uh, and if you it would not be, uh, you know, familiar to this area at all but you, you're kind of used to seeing the, uh, the levels of detail but to put some scale on it, there are three transistors there on the bottom diagram and that's the level of, uh, of information that has to be precisely prescribed to connect just three transistors together all those layers of metal and the insulations between them just to connect three transistors and yet there is about a billion on an integrated circuit of that nature scary stuff. <coughs> lots and lots of designers, Apple is usually fairly uh, uh, cagey about this kind of information but they were pressed uh, back in 2011 and they listed 159 tier 1 suppliers. These are the companies that feed into their manufacturing, their, their top level manufacturing activity. 159. Thousands of design engineers, tens of thousands of engineers, all of them global. And ARM is not listed in there. Why? Because ARM is a tier 2 supplier. We're a supplier to suppliers. We're not a supplier to top level products. And there are tier 3 suppliers. So there are thousands and thousands of designers and companies who are involved in the creation of a, uh, of a smartphone. Most of them are invisible. So what does ARM really do then? And I put the really word in here because everybody knows what ARM does, but nobody does really. Um, we are, we're supplying the CPU, it's a fairly simple idea, there's the CPU, I'm not asking you to, to study it in detail, it won't challenge many of you for very long. Uh, the idea was uh, that prior to ARM the only way you could get a CPU was as a chip, we put it forward the idea that you could, uh, you could actually use it a little bit like a Lego, bro a Le a Lego block and connect it into, into something else that somebody else was making. And that was the first chip in which this was used. And to put some scale on that, that's the ARM 7 core at the bottom. Today it's one of our simplest cores. It's about 15,000 gates. It's tiny. And the system that we were talking about putting together was the, the bits around the outside. And what our novelty here was, let's treat the ARM 7 core as a component and let everybody else put anything else they want to in the rest of the chip. It was novel at the time. But the systems got ever more complex, and today's users require what amounts to a supercomputer in their pockets. We're talking about, in that NVIDIA, I said there were six ARM processor cores, that's around the back. But uh, commensurate with that, we had an example implementation. This is the sort of thing that we deliver to our customers to help them to create things like that. And this example implementation had ten processors on board, four ARM 9s, four Mali, um, 400, uh, 400 fragment processors, vertex processors, video codecs, uh, and it came with all the software stacks, OSs, and design tools necessary. Not surprisingly, a substantially different product in, the set, in one sense, but yet still the same concept. A component which drops in on which people can build their systems for, pro for productivity. It becomes a platform tool. This platform tool here that we deliver as part of a, a design kit is something which goes to those customers they throw away the pieces that they don't need they connect the stuff in that they want to design they use that as the as the basis of designing the chip but not only designing the chip but of configuring the software tools and the OS's that, that are required because they don't want to spend time doing that they want to get on with making their differentiation the bit that they add which makes their product different from their competitors product this is commodity Maybe high tech, maybe very exciting, but it's commodity. So by definition, ARM is a platform company, but what platform? Several platforms. And here we are, software, CPU, GPUs, interconnect, physical IP. That's part of the platform. The other part of the platform is the 900 partners, 800 licensees and millions of developers who are familiar with our IP. Because those guys and gals, when they're given a, a, a problem to solve, they will tend to use the thing that they know. They never get sacked, fired, for choosing ARM. Now that's something which is a great thing for us to have, but it's not something we can rest on. We can't, you know, just because you could this year, the systems are going to be twice as complex next year. They've got to be, they've got to be confident in that decision. So we have to work very hard to make sure that they maintain the absolute confidence that they won't get sacked for choosing ARM because they will be able to get a product out of the door 
more or less on time to the quality that's required and more or less to the cost and so on. It's predictable. It's a platform. And it's the methodology as well as hardware. C, C++, development, debug and trace, middleware. This is not worth anything to us in a financial sense, but it's all necessary to our customers because they can't use what we're providing unless they've got this stuff to back it up. The right horse for the right course. Uh, well, we've got basically here two families, uh, the, um, the GPU type families and the CPU type families. And um, we have the very simplest process, of course, of them all, the M0 families. And the scale in those is the difference between 50 million transistors and 50,000 transistors. Only gives you about five times in, uh, performance speed, but that difference of complexity makes, of course, a, a product which is far more suited to the application space. It actually means that we have 24 processors in six families in ARM at the moment that we're supporting. Most people think of ARM as just, well, it's an A processor, isn't it? There's 24 there, and there, that's only separating it at the moment from the implementation technology. So these are designs, they're not designs committed to TSMC 28 micron or, or, or 28 nanometer. These are designs which are ready to be targeted to whatever process you want to put them on. They're all designed to be fat power efficient, but power, efficient on, power efficiency only goes some way. Watts don't just happen, they're caused by the environment in which they find and find themselves. Um, so it's a feature of all our product ranges and, they have to, and we have to uh, support that as much as we can. And the, the biggest power option comes from maximizing or matching the processor to the application. Uh, because if you have a, a, an overkill processor, then you are definitely going to be wasting power. But there's lots of other things in there. Minimizing the clock frequency, variable and gated voltages, all of these things, and the software support and the system support, all of these things have to be catered for in the platform product that we provide to our customers. Because our customers are not interested in any of these things. They're only interested in what it can do for them in a business. Excuse my phone. It's telling me I should be shutting up sometime soon. <coughs> Hardware dissipates, but software makes it happen. Now, it's kind of well known that parallel is more power efficient than, uh, than, uh, than simply sticking with a single processor. I'm not going to, to go through the math on it. It's not that complicated. The factor is determined by either Amdahl or Gustafsson. Amdahl says if you take what is uh, essentially a serial c uh, piece of code and you extract the natural parallelism from it, then you can achieve probably three or four times uh, improvement in power efficiency as a maximum. Uh, Gustafsson, on the other hand, he took the other approach and said, if you had an infinite number of processes available to you, how would you design your system so that you use them all, then you get very much higher power eff uh, efficiency issue, uh, factors. But the difference is, of course, that we have to remember that reuse factor. Very few people are starting off in the Gustafsson environment. Most people are starting off in the Amdahl environment. It's the code that they've got which determines what they've got to do. Now, Core Link, recognizing that um, we need to be able to support multi-core because multi-core is more power efficient and power efficiency is, is part of our DNA, then we have to support a methodology which is going to support it, and that's Core Link. Core Link here is supporting four A, uh, ARM A15s. Uh, over there, there's the DSP, the Marley set, and there's others. So we're, we're talking in that particular up to 18 amber interfaces for, for CPU type products. We have to have a methodology which supports this. And of course the extent of that methodology today is the Big Little product. Big Little is quite innovative in the sense that most people when they cluster CPUs are doing it for performance reasons. But performance means something different in the embedded space because performance can mean power efficiency too. And so the idea then of creating a micro cluster on chip of eight CPUs four of which are designed for power efficiency and four of which are designed for sheer horsepower. Uh, all it means now is that under the software control you can assign tasks or threads to either a processor uh, which, is a, which is going to deliver you performance or to a processor which is going to deliver you power. 
we're giving the software the opportunity to manage the power efficiency of the device and this is the ultimate objective in all of this and we're talking quite significant power savings here more than 30 percent well I'm not going to uh, go into the details of this but little is the same processor but synthesized differently it has a much shorter pipeline it doesn't go in for speculative uh, decodes uh, and it doesn't handle out of order uh, multi-issue pipelines and so on which are all in the high performance big uh, the big little uh, nomenclature is marketing I'm afraid and we have two different software packages which support this the CPU migration package which basically says I'll leave it entirely up to you to choose the processor that you want to use when you, do, when you use it and to switch when it seems appropriate or the big little MP where effectively all of the CPUs are just a resource and there is a scheduler inside the, uh, inside the kernel which looks after the, uh, the most efficient uh, targeting of the, the threads to the kernels this is very popular and is just starting to, uh, to take off in big time. So just approaching my last slide, businesses within the global life cycle. Now, it's sometimes hard to imagine just how many opportunities there are in that jigsaw puzzle that I illustrated. But here is the single one-line concept through to decommissioning. It's the life cycle of an electronic system. <coughs> Most life cycles will end somewhere about qualify or reproduce, as far as most people are concerned. Once I've made this thing, once they've, they've qualified it and they've got it product ready, then I can go home. Well, actually, that's true for you as a product designer, but the life cycle of the product doesn't end until that thing is decommissioned and taken apart. And, uh, and it doesn't end until it's, it's lived through a lifetime of upgrades and maintenance. So it means that essentially there is a lot of stuff under each one of those without going into the details of the individual f um, flows inside them, all of which represent opportunities. The design tools in the design area and the training in the design area is different from the tools and the training in other areas. So you can quite easily see how a company can pick on specific opportunities throughout that life cycle and another company pick up on other opportunities throughout that life cycle because they can do them better than if that primary company, the company A, tried to do it all itself. The company A will never be good at everything. What it strives to be is good at the thing it does. So all platforms are valued in the product life cycle, and it's a significant point here. All products offer something that people want. All platforms, I'm sorry, offer something that people want. Not all of them are valuable, however. Valuable means that you can make commercial value and value and opportunity out of it. So you do find there is space in there for the open and free uh, software. Um, it's something which can't be commercialized anymore. It's something which a community is interested in. It's also something which companies are interested in because they need the utility that it provides. But it doesn't justify commercial um, opportunity anymore. And it is the feature of this global village that we live in, this network, this community, this cluster that we work in, that we're able to do that. We can find people with time, with interest, with skills, across the world to address these things which are no longer commercial opportunities but are nonetheless valuable for it. Still, moving rapidly on to conclusions then. Some points for you to remember. Business is about making money for investors. Technology is just a product, it just enables product op options, not all of which are valuable. Just remember that if nothing more sig uh, significant comes out of this talk then I think it's worth it because you have to exist. We all exist in a money-making environment. Platforms are just productivity aids. They're a way of creating new products quickly and cheaply as possible. They are all valued. They are not all valuable. Arm is a productivity aid company and it's the, and it's the biggest market for, its con for consumers today. Uh, so by definition, we are a product uh, platform company and we are providing platforms into this area. And I would also like to, like to hope that ARM will maintain this position as a global leader in it, but there's no guarantees on that. The systems are getting more complex two times every 18 months, and ARM only maintains that position by working very, very hard to do so. 
The thing that will be the true platform for the 21st century is electronic systems. This is what people will be, it's the nearest things to customer's awareness. Electronic systems are something you can tell your granny about, you can tell your husbands and wives about, you can tell your politicians about. Because electronic systems are the things that enable them to deliver what they want to deliver to society or to enable them to buy the products that they want to buy from the shops. And I think that if you can be associated in that life cycle, then that is something that matters because it brings the consumer and the technologist together. So the electronic systems is the answer to the product platform for the 21st century. Thank you for listening. Yeah.